Okay, everybody, welcome uh, to our first Ephesians uh, Bible study with Echo Church. We are all on Zoom together, and everybody wave. You can wave to everybody that's, uh, that's going to be following along with us later on. And uh, really, the idea of this study is that um, it's, it's more free form than you would maybe think if you were showing up to a Bible study. You oftentimes would have like a podium or a lectern, and somebody would stand up there and they would give their sort of monologue and, um, and then everybody would sort of take notes. And I love those kinds of studies. Uh, I love sitting in them. I, I love the chance to teach that kind of study. But I think because we're in, we're in Zoom together and um, this is a little bit of a smaller uh, a study in the sense that we have about 14 or 15. I'm going to keep admitting people as they come in here. Uh, I think it really gives us a chance to uh, really just ask a lot of questions, have a lot of uh, feedback. You know, what are you, what are you hearing? How are you understanding the text? Let's talk through it, uh, things like that. So I've done some study ahead of time uh, in the text, and then uh, really what I want to do is just kind of walk us through, and I want to just start asking questions and uh, and see. Uh, see how far we get. My goal is to get through all of chapter one today. So we'll see if we can do that. So we will move fairly quickly. It's not going to be focus on the minutia of every word, but if we get to a place where there's something, uh, some rich theology that we want to stop and kind of ponder on, we have the freedom to do that. So um, it's fairly free form. So I want you to feel free to, to jump in, ask questions. Uh, remember to hit that unmute button before you talk. Uh, so we can actually hear uh, what you're saying. So with that said, I'm going to move over to a share screen now and uh, bring up the the work that I've been doing in uh, in the book of, of Ephesians. So hopefully you all can see, and can I just get a confirm from somebody that you all can see my mouse and that you can see this program with this phrase on it right here? Somebody just give me a yes, you can see that, or a no, you can't. See my mouse moving? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. This is part of just figuring out all the technical glitches here. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, what you're looking at right here is something, it's a program called Bible Arc, and I highly recommend this for uh, doing any kind of deep study uh, of the word. What it allows you to do is to break the text up. So, what you're looking at is Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, verses three, and we're going all the way down to verse 14 down here at the bottom. And, um, and it has allowed me to really break the text up into what we call phrases. And uh, phrases, there's some technical rules as far as how you break them up exactly. But for somebody that's just jumping in, you can really just kind of take the text in pieces. You can break it apart. You can bring things underneath. Um, so I want to introduce this program and commit it to you. Uh, BibleArc.com. If you are uh, are interested in um, getting this for yourself, uh, but I'm going to be using this a lot uh, during our our time together, and uh, and so uh, you'll notice that there is there's a line at the top here, and then we've kind of tabbed things in as we go. I'm going to talk about that in a sec. Why why that is so significant for our study of our text uh, this this uh, morning. And, and uh, you can see that you can, you can highlight and you can draw arrows and, and all kinds of things, which really point things to other things. Um, and so I, I have found it to be really helpful. This is how I prepare all my sermons. Uh, I first do a phrase of the text uh, in, in, uh, in Bible Arc. So with that said, I'd like to open it up. Let's talk about Ephesians in general. Uh, for a little bit. Let's just talk about maybe uh, start with maybe the, the, the structure of the book. How, how does, for those of you that have had some experience in Ephesians before, how is Ephesians structured? How, how do you feel like the book is written and how can you break it down maybe into some smaller sections? Anybody have an idea on that? I think uh, it, it, it kind of, um, is meant for kind of like a new believer or, or one that's kind of fostering like those that are kind of young in the faith. Um, I mean, I don't know if that's kind of like, that's one of my observations when I started reading this the first yeah. time. So what makes you say that, Andrew? Young in the faith. What, what, what are some things in Ephesians that make you feel like 
that it would be maybe a book that's for someone who's young in the faith, maybe as opposed to, um, you know, a more mature believer? Um, so like compared to the other letters that Paul wrote to other um, churches to encourage them in their faith, um, this one's meant to kind of, uh, uh, it, it, it designs the, um, like kind of like the basis of where the Christian faith is, is from, um, coming from like, like it shows like the kind of a trinity uh, like there is a trinity in there um it shows the doc talks about predestination um the elect uh it talks about who christ is and who we are in respect to him um okay. even further on i'll talk about like who, uh, where we were like apart from god's grace and or apart from god before grace so that that's kind of like where I'm kind of getting at. Yeah. So, so you're saying that there's kind of a, there's a, a simplicity to, uh, to the book and it's talking about some, some of the basic truths that we, that we come to know and love maybe from the beginning of our, of our faith. So the things that we're learning at the very beginning. Yeah, I, I think that's true. I mean, there's definitely complexity here. There's definitely deep, rich theology that maybe takes, years to study. Um, but I can see what you're saying, that there's a simplicity to um, even the, the overall structure of the book, which we'll talk about in a sec. Anybody have any other thoughts on when you think of the structure of Ephesians, or you think of the whole of the book, what are some things that we can add to the conversation here about Ephesians? Yeah, I think an easy one to, at least for me, that's been helpful to understand the book is a uh, uh, chapters one through three are gospel truth and uh, four five and six are uh, the implications of that truth. So gospel truth, gospel implication. Um, it's kind of the bookend. So here's the gospel, therefore go do this. So chapters one and three is the gospel, four, five, and six are the imperatives to that. Exactly. And that's one of the major things we all want to catch at the very beginning. Thanks, Danny. Um, is the way is the really the two major subdivisions of the book everybody uh g with your bibles open and this is where i'm limited on zoom so i'm going to actually take a second to try to do this i'm going to share a different screen that's going to have um let's see what, what what can i do here i'm going to share this one okay so you guys can now see hopefully um you can see my my logos here and uh, this is another program for, for Bible study. Um, let me make, I'm probably going to mess this up if I make it full screen. Let me try to make it full screen real quick. Okay, can you, I want to make sure somebody can chime in here. Make sure you're seeing my full screen with the, with the Bible text on it. Thank you. I got yes, Danny. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so in Ephesians, let's just look at what we're, what, what, what we've got here from a, at a glance. Okay. So the book begins in obviously with a greeting and then, and then really what you see here over this, these next, these first three chapters is, well, really what I should say is maybe what you don't see, what you don't see, you don't see direct commands. Okay, so you are not saying, Paul is not giving this list of things that you need to do as a Christian. What he is doing is things like this, and this is where we're going to get to. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Now, we'll talk about more of what that is in particular, but the idea here is that at the very beginning of the book, and really for the first three chapters, the book is about what, ha what we have been blessed with and what our place is in Christ and, and the implications, I would say the first, just the theology behind that first. Then notice this, if you've not noticed it before, once you get, remember, six chapters in the book of Ephesians, once you get to the end of that first section, the end of chapter three, he kind of ends with this worship here at the end of the first section. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we, that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. It's almost as if he ended 
um, as if he's done, as if we're ready to walk away, we're re ready to walk away from the book. But, but it's, just, it's showing that at, at the end of the first half of Ephesians, we worship over what Christ has given us. And then it's like in chapter four, now it's time to live our lives in light of all that we've been given in chapters one through three. So notice it here, chapter four, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk. Now this word is huge in the book. And I hope to be able to spend some time looking at it carefully uh, over the next few weeks. Walking is the idea of living your life now, how the decisions you make, the, the, um, the whole of your life and the, the progression of your life in holiness. So walking, what does he ask you to, us to do? Walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So you could say in some sense that chapters one through three is describing the calling to which you have been called. And then chapters four through six focuses on this idea of walking in a manner worthy of chapters one through three. So now somebody, somebody tell me, why is this significant for the Christian life for chapters one through three to be before chapters four through six? I think it's because we need to know why we're walking. We need to know what Christ has done for us. And that, like Danny was saying, like there's implications as to why we walk in a manner worthy of, of the calling. Um, yeah. Amen. Amen. We need to know, we need to know why. And what's the danger, perhaps? If, and it's not to say that there aren't books of the Bible that don't, it's not to say there aren't books in the Bible that begin with commands. There are. There are books in the Bible that are not structured this way. It's not like every book has to be structured exactly the same. But what's the danger maybe if Paul in the book of Ephesians had begun with chapters four through six before giving us chapters one through three? Do anybody think of a, of a potential danger or misleading? Um, I think that like... Uh... If you do it kind of like in reverse almost, it kind of implies like works-based faith. Like yeah. you do works and then you'll have faith. Yeah, it, ex exactly. So if, it, if the, 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 the danger is that we start with this works-based faith, we start with this idea that, hey, you've got to do, do, do in the Christian life. And let's be careful to, to keep the balance here. There is a living out of the faith that must happen. There is a fruit that must happen in the Christian life. However, it isn't first theologically. What's first theologically is what we have received from Christ. It, we receive before we work. We, re we receive, the tree receives nourishment before it produces fruit. You can't just pluck a tree up from the soil, not give it any sunlight, not give it any water and go, come on tree. Why aren't you producing good fruit? Um, first, there's a process that takes place. And the, the Ephesians 1 through 3 could be the description of the soil and the, and the sun and the water and the nutrients that are flowing to that tree, the Christian. And then chapters 4 through 6 could be, okay, now we're watching the fruit bud on the branches of that tree. So there's definitely a one before the other. And it's beautiful, I think, how Paul has put chapters one through three as the nutrients of the Christian life, and chapters four through six are the are the fruit of uh, the process of the fruit developing in the Christian life. So that's great, you guys. Anybody else? I'm just gonna make sure I haven't missed anybody who's coming in now. Um, anybody else? Um, thoughts on the structure of Ephesians? Okay, I'm going to assume no other thoughts means that everything is clear and everybody's got it all figured out, right? So um, let's go. Uh, let's go now and, and just talk about. Um, 
let's, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the, on a, on a typical introduction to this book. And, and one of the reasons for that is uh, Ephesians is a, uh, a book that I believe, and I think most uh, scholars who are, um, who spend a lot of time in Ephesians have argued that this is the case. Ephesians was meant to not necessarily just be a book to the Ephesian church. Now that's interesting because if you think of the book of Corinthians, for instance, the book of Corinthians was entirely written to the book, to the church in Corinth. They had some specific questions that they were asking and Paul was answering their specific questions and writing to them. And, uh, and so you'll see names in the, in the book of Corinthians. You'll see specific heresies that were coming up that they need to fight against. You'll see all these things that were very specific to that church. I think the book of Ephesians, yes, it was written to the book of Ephesus. However, I think that Paul had intended that the book, that the letter would also be read in churches that were around that area and maybe even read to all the churches all over the place. And so what we see in the book of Ephesians is we see more general theology about the Christian life. Um, you, so those of you that have been in the Mining God's Word study, um, you, you may recall that in Philippians, um, he lists some very specific names in there. Um, I'm going to go back to our, our text here for a second. He lists, in, in Philippians, he, um, he actually gets into a couple of, there's even a couple of people in the church that are not getting along. You guys know this right here? I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Well, well what, what does that mean? It means that in the Philippian church, a different letter, you know, to a different church, in the Philippian church, there were these two ladies that were actually having an argument and disagreement. And Paul writes to them and says, I want those two ladies to get along. Like, like I'm, I'm telling you, you guys, you guys need to work out your problems. In Ephesians, you're not going to find that. In Ephesians, it's very, um, it's very uh, general theology for the Christian life. So um, one, one thing that uh, scholars have pointed to, I want to just see if I can get, uh, get it here on a search, is uh, where Paul will actually say, so for instance, let's look at, so let's look at Colossians. Notice, notice this idea here in, in Colossians. Um, he says to the Colossian church, and when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of, La of the Laodiceans and see that, that you also read the letter from Laodicea. So what's happening here? The Colossian letter, Paul says, I want you to spread this to other churches. I actually want, I, this isn't just for you. This is for others as well. And I, re, I wrote a letter to the, to the church of, in Laodicea. Now, wouldn't that be interesting to have, right? Paul wrote a letter similar to the book of Colossians, maybe, that went to the church of Laodicea. And he said to the Colossian church, I want you to have, I want you to read their letter because their letter contains truths that I want you to have. Now, in God's providence and, you know, in, in what we understand to be the, the doctrine of the inspiration of scripture, that letter hasn't made it into our canon. And we've, I don't, to my knowledge, we've never found a letter like that. Um, and so in God's providence, we don't, we don't need that for our faith. But um, still, from a historical standpoint, really interesting that there was another letter circling around. But I think I'm, I'm telling you guys this about Colossians because uh, I think that uh, Ephesians was a similar letter. I think he would have said, hey, read my letter around at, in, in all the different churches. And that, may, that means that this letter, um, this Ephesian letter, has um, just general specifics in it. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, general, general truths rather than specific truths for, for a specific church. Um, and so I'm not going to spend a lot of time introing the book. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about uh, the, the church at Ephesus in the first century. Those are things you guys can read about if you're interested in, in knowing those things. Uh, we, can, uh, we can definitely, I can definitely direct you guys some, to some resources on that. 
but I, I want to jump into the text. I want to jump into what does this mean for, for, for our lives and, uh, and just enjoy the fact that these are general theological truths that every single one of us can really uh, apply and know and know more about God and who he is and how he interacts with us. Um, so with that said, let's jump into the text. Any other questions or thoughts before we, uh, before we get in here? Okay, so we're going to jump in to Ephesians, and, and really, if you guys look in your Bibles at the first two verses, um, they're, they're very typical of a greeting that Paul would give uh, to a church. Uh, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so you would see a greeting like that appear in almost every one of Paul's letters with some variation, okay? And I just want to point out a couple of things that are just interesting in, in all of Paul's greetings that, that we, um, you might want to consider also when you're reading other books. For instance, let's consider Paul's use of the word apostle here. Um, if, you, if you look at the other letters that Paul writes, for instance, for those of you that have your Bibles, like paper Bibles, just flip a couple pages over to Philippians and look at what Paul says in the very first words of Philippians. So Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. That's interesting. So sometimes Paul introduces himself as a servant. And sometimes Paul introduces himself, like in Ephesians, as an apostle. Sometimes, like the book of Romans, Paul will introduce himself as an apostle and a servant. Um, and then, and so what you can see here is you can, you can tend to get a general feel for the tone of a book off of the first words of that book, specifically whether Paul introduces himself as an apostle or as a servant. Now, let me ask you guys, why might Paul, it, let's start with the word servant, not the, not the word he uses here in Ephesians, but let's start with the word servant. Why might Paul want to introduce himself as a servant at the beginning of certain books? What, what do you think might be in that book or a tone that the book would strike if he, if he introduces himself as a servant? Uh, I think, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I think the, the first thing that comes to mind for me is uh, the use of servant might be um, more of a familiarity with the people in the church there mm -hmm. and more of a, of a like brother to brother, brother to sister kind of relationship um, that he's talking into. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. There's a familiarity there for sure. When we think of servant, we think of humility. Um, Paul will strike a, a humble tone with certain churches. Like for those of you that know the book of Philippians, can anybody testify to the fact that Philippians is a, I mean, what kind of a book is Philippians? Is he, is he combating heresy and talking about these heretical teachers and how terrible they are? Is he telling the church that they've screwed up? What kind of, what kind of tone is the book of Philippians for those of you that have some familiarity with it? I think it's more of like an encouragement. Like he opens up saying like, I've been praying for you. <laughs> like in all my prayers, I miss you all. I love you all. It's just a very kind of different tone. Exactly. There's, there's very little talk about heresy here. There's very little talk about teachers that are, that are leading them astray. This is the, they, they've talked about Philippians being the, the joy letter because the word joy or rejoice appears so many times. Uh, and Paul is just overjoyed with the Philippians. He is, he is just like, keep going, keep doing what you're doing. I'm so excited to be partnering with you in the gospel, which is 
one of the main themes of the book of Philippians, partnership in the gospel. Um, and so, man, I'm Paul, your humble servant. I'm your fellow servant in the Lord. But anybody know the book of Galatians? Could anybody contrast Philippians with Galatians for a minute? Yeah, Galatians is a uh, letter of correction. He's correcting them and kind of rebuking them throughout the whole letter. Exactly. There's this, there's this specific heresy that's worked its way in. You guys know um, there's some really famous passages of Galatians. Chapter 3, verse 1. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. And so he... Somebody has come in and bewitched them. Somebody has like turned them from the faith. And he is, Paul is like going to, he's going to bat against these false teachers and on behalf of the Galatians. How would you guess Paul starts the book of Galatians? Is it servant or apostle? Yeah, apostle. Yeah, Paul, an apostle. So the idea here is that we typically can see themes in a book, even just from the way Paul introduces himself in the book. So what might we expect from the book of Ephesians if we have Paul introduce himself as an apostle of Christ Jesus? One of teaching and admonishment and correction. Yeah, so he's, we're definitely going to see correction and, and teaching and admonishment. Yep, all of those things are good. He's not necessarily coming like the book of Philippians that I'm your fellow servant. I, he's got some, that apostle word is, it kind of carries an authority with it, right? And Paul's willing to use that authority when, it, when that authority serves the church. And so here Paul is going to definitely speak with an air of authority as he comes to these these, uh, these Christians, and he says, look, this is how we're called to live the, the Christian life. I'm, I, think of, um, I think of chapter 5, right, where he starts in chapter 5, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. Um, and he goes on to talk about sin and, and how like, he is just using his authority as an apostle to say, don't let these things characterize your life. So it's good to just open up and understand what the first words of the, of the greeting are and how Paul introduces himself. That's really as far as I'm gonna go with the greeting. Um, we, we're, we're, we're limited on time and we, we have a big, amazing section of Ephesians chapter one, verses three to 14 to get into. Um, anybody have any questions or thoughts, anything further on the greeting, verses one and two? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm, I know I'm giving these awkward pauses, but I'm just trying to give somebody a second to unmute themselves if they want to um, share. Uh, and so, yes, I'm hearing somebody. Justin, um, yeah. I, I want to see, um, is, is this the um, first John written to uh, the same people, right? So is, is it the same things that they're addressing, like the same kind of tone? Oh, good. Yeah, so good, good point. So first John is an obviously different author. Uh, it's the, it's, it's John, um, you know, John, the original disciple and who's now an apostle. Um, but, but yeah, you're right. John, uh, John was a pastor, um, one of the pastors of Ephesus. And that was much later uh, in, in that time. So um, is it dealing with the same themes? No. Um, I mean, in general, the same themes. It's the same. It's in the same Bible, right? But Ephesians and First John are are just very different. They're very different books. They they're dealing. They're coming from a different individual. 
Um, John is different from Paul. Um, not that he believes different theology, just that the way he approaches things is different. Um, the dating of the letter, I don't plan to really get into that too much, but um, Paul would have been writing Ephesians far earlier than John would have been writing uh, First John. And we, and how we know that we can, you guys can, I can turn you guys to some, some good scholars that can point to some of the dating here, but um, Ephesus was planted early in Paul's ministry. And uh, we see, Ev we see Ephesus appear again in anybody know the last time we see Ephesus appear in the Bible. Anybody have, uh, there's a quick, quick Bible trivia here. Well, I think Revelation. The book of Revelation. Exactly. So Revelation has the, the Jesus writes a letter to the church of Ephesus uh, in Revelation. And by that time, Ephesus has become something different than it was in Paul's time. So, I mean, you're talking about a span of, you know, 40, 50 years. Imagine what happens in a church in 40 or 50 years. That church can become a completely different place, you know, in that, in that span of time. Um, and we know that Ephesus eventually uh, was removed as it was gone as a church. It was gone as a city and gone as a church. So the full story of Ephesus is a sad story, uh, but it begins on a bright note. And it begins with, you know, Paul spending, uh, spending years in the city, um, talking to these believers and planting this church. And, and then by the time John takes over later on, um, you know, there's different things going on in the church. So I don't see a, a huge amount of similarity and it's hard to trace one church over 40, 50 years, but Justin, that's a great thought. And I would say maybe you spend some time on your own doing some study on that. You guys, and you can bring us, you know, kind of what the fruit of your study is on that. Cause I've, I've not spent a lot of time thinking of, of it, but I do know the difference between Ephesians and first John and they're just hitting different themes. So good question. Okay, <laughs> let's, let's jump into uh, Ephesians 1 and look at verses 3 to 14. Now, what's amazing about 3 through 14 is that in the Greek, not in your English Bibles, but in the Greek, this is one sentence. Um, apparently, Greek school teachers didn't teach their, their uh, school children about run-on sentences because this happens a lot in the Greek. Uh, you have these run-on sentences that we, and I'm joking, of course, in the Greek, that wasn't a problem at all. It was not an issue to have a run-on sentence. In our English, uh, the way we write now in English, we want shorter, choppier sentences. But um, back then, it was like, hey, if you, you just keep going. You just keep going with your sentence. But what's amazing about that is, really, if you guys think about it, one sentence captures one idea. Uh, so when you put a period at the end of a sentence, you're kind of saying that idea is done. Now let's move on to another idea. Now the next idea might support the previous idea, but a period at the end says that idea is now done. And, and so you can really find in one given sentence, one idea. And that's what's amazing about three uh, verses three through 14. It's one sentence. What does that mean? It means that there's really one idea. You can sum all of those, what is it, 11 verses? All 11 verses up into one main idea and ask yourself, what's the one thing Paul is doing here? Well, he's doing one thing. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't tons of theology underneath that one thing, um, kind of supporting and providing the foundation for that one thing. But nonetheless, we can say Paul is doing one thing here. And that's what I want to start with. I want to start by looking at the, the one thing. Now, one of the things phrasing lets you do is it really helps you to see the one thing. Thing. So does anybody have a guess, just looking at our phrase, looking at the screen here, I'm just kind of spanning it up and down so you can see. Anybody have a guess? What, what do you think is the one thing Paul is doing in these 11 verses? Is he talking about the Trinity? He definitely does that. 
That's, that's what's amazing about uh, this section as well. He definitely does that. I don't think I would say that that's the one thing. I think that the Trinity is showing up here for sure. And we're going to talk about that. Is he praising Christ? Yeah. Now, how did you, how did you get that? Uh, there's a lot of repetition. Um, uh, in him, in Christ, it okay. goes on and on. Okay. The repetition he, is an important thing. Don't quit. So, so all these in Christ here, in him, in Christ, we're going to talk about these. Um, yeah, so he, he's definitely praising. I didn't, I didn't listen all the way through to the end of your statement there. Who is he praising? Who specifically oh. is he praising? God the Father. Yes. How how do you know that, David? What what are you seeing here in the text that is that is telling you that the main thing Paul is doing here is praising God the Father? He starts out with uh, "Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ," and then I guess in praising, if it's all the way to the to the left, that's what your main point is. Yes. So in phrasing, one, one of the things phrasing lets you do is it, is it tells you, okay, what's the, main, what's the main sentence or the main fragment of the sentence? And if you guys can see, it's actually the first, it's the first phrase of the sentence. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Stop. If you had to sum up 30 through 14, you would sum it up by saying what Paul is doing here is blessing or our word would be praising God the Father. Do you see that there? Do you see that that's the main line? It's on the far left side of the margin. And really, and this is what's incredible about this, is it's the only thing on the far left side of the margin. Everything else is subordinate to the main idea that Paul is doing, which is just praising the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. That's, that's how we would sum it all up. Um, so man, that's, that's amazing. So Paul starts the letter. He's not even writing anything to them as Christians yet. He's just simply saying, I want to begin with worship. I want to begin by praising God. Now, the next thing we want to ask is, well, then what's he praising God for? What's the content of his praise? When we, when we praise God, we don't just say, God, we praise you. I mean, we, we kind of use that language sometimes, or God, we love you. But scripture is often um, encouraging us to get content behind our praise. Why are we praising God? What is it that is so amazing about God? That's why we study God's attributes, right? That's why we, that's why we look speci at specifics of scripture, and we want to get scripture behind our praise, because to simply say, well, praise God, okay, that's great. But what's the reason? What's underneath our praise? That's what provides robust worship when we're actually praising God with specifics. So what are the specifics here that we see? What is it that we are praising God, that Paul starts praising God about? Why is he praising God? He, it, it seems like he is praising God for all the all the blessings that he has bestowed on us. If you go through the passage, it talks about uh, he chose us in verse four, um, and it just goes goes on and on. We have redemption in him in verse seven. Um, yeah, so those are some of the things that that jump out. All the all the blessings that we have uh, in Jesus Christ. Yes, yes. So you see, do you guys see it here? The second line. And realize, you guys see the second line is actually, there's nothing else equal to the second line. Why are we praising God? Because he has blessed us. Wow. Okay. Now, there's so much like we could talk about just, just with that, right? What, we're praising God because he blessed us. There's specific um, reasons underneath this and one of the things is we can say wow like you have look at what you look at what i have because i'm in you and god gives us permission to do that he gives us permission to say what is it that we have because we're in christ and to love what we have because we're in christ and then to turn what we have 
what we've been received by Christ back to praise to, to him. It's like this cycle of I receive from the Lord and then I turn back around and praise God for what I've received from the Lord. And it's just this constant, never ending cycle. And so, yes, Patrick is, let's just look at what Patrick is seeing here. What are some of the things Patrick is seeing? Who has blessed us? So God has blessed us in Christ, of course. We're going to talk about that. But then look at this again, down here at the bottom of the section in verse six, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us. So you're seeing a repeat here in the, in the, in the text. He starts out with he's blessed us, but then way down again, he's blessed us in the beloved. And I think that starts us on then the three sections that flow afterwards. So you see that all three of these sections are pointing to the, he has blessed us in the beloved. So then we're going to ask the question in these three sections, how has he blessed us? So Patrick noticed, like, for instance, right here, we have redemption. That's one of the ways in which he has blessed us. We have redemption through his blood. Okay, what are some of the others? What are the other areas that ones that we're seeing here that are that we can add to our list of how has God blessed us in Christ? You've obtained an, an inheritance. Yeah. So now you, you just go to this next line, right? You just see this next main line that shows up here. We've obtained an inheritance. Wow. There's so much we've got to talk about there, but what does that mean? But that's, that's another way that Paul is saying he's blessed us. Somebody give me uh, the third. Redemption. We've obtained an inheritance. What's the third one? A promise. Sealed, right? Sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Whatever that means. We're, we're, we haven't done the study to know yet what that means. But man, Paul is saying that these are specifically three things that we have received um, that he has blessed us with. How about up here in the introduction? I, I, I consider this first section to be kind of an an introduction to the blessings. What kind of blessings are we seeing up here in verses three through six? He pre predestined us for adoption as sons. Yes. Predestined us for adoption as sons. That's, he says, that's a blessing. That is a, that is something that we've received. That is a gift from God. What else? The other one I see is this choosing us. Now you might think, well, what's the difference between predestined and chose us? And these are a lot of strange, like why, why would he use these two words together? It might be that that means the same thing. Yet predestining us and choosing us means the same thing, but he definitely says it two different ways here. So his election, this is where we get our word election. That's the word that means he chose us. Um, and so our election is a gift. It's something that Paul says, here's how God has blessed you. He chose you. And we're supposed to see that and we're supposed to respond with praise back to him. Blessed be the God and Father. Why? Why am I praising you, God? Because you've blessed us. How have you blessed us? You chose us. Um, we, you, we have... We weren't an afterthought. We, weren't, we didn't get tagged on to the end of this process. You have been considering us and thinking us in your election. <clears throat> How long? When did it start? Anybody know? When that election took place here in the text? Before the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world. I have a question. That's about that. crazy. That yeah. Question. Can we say that, like, uh, would be safe to say that also um, being holy and blameless would also be the, a, a blessing to be looked at in that way? Yes. Yeah, so, so then what flows from the choosing? This is, oh, man, you guys, this is so crazy. What flows from the choosing? What comes as a result of the fact that he chose us? He chose us with a purpose or a result that what? 
that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. So there's this, um, there's this result that happens in our life because of election, because of the fact that he, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Um, my goodness, there's always so much depth, but that's, that is, uh, so I don't know if that gets at what, what, it, was there a question there, Justin, specifically about that? Oh, no, just, just the way you, you were, you were saying it, like, which ones are the blessings and would, would it, with, can we say holiness is the yeah. blessing, is the blessing, yeah. Yes, and I think specifically because, because we see it buried under choosing, choosing us, I would say that specifically it's a blessing that flows out of our, our being, our being chosen. He chose us in him. Now we get really, we, we, we struggle with that uh, doctrine, right? I mean, that's, that's a tough doctrine to wrap our heads around, but something that uh, pastor Chris Lewis at Foothill has often repeated. And I really, I really like it is that when you look at election in the Bible, <coughs> it isn't, it isn't there to try to spin your head in circles. It's there, it's there to specifically bring about praise to, to the Lord. So here's a perfect example of that. We have been chosen. What's the result of this? Praise God. Bless God. Um, oftentimes we make it a theological thing where we're, we're trying to argue it. We're trying to, you know, some people are trying to beat people over the head with their, with their doctrine and their theology, right? When in reality, what we see in scripture is under, like understand it. Yes. Understand the fact that we've been chosen. But when you feel that, don't feel that as a bad thing. Feel that as a, you have been chosen. Praise God that he chose you because it's not, it has, doesn't have to do with anything in you, which we're going to learn in chapter two. Chapter two is going to say, well, based upon what, what, what merit do you have? None, nothing, not according to works, right? So we're, we, should, we should use this as fuel for our worship rather than fuel for debate. And it doesn't mean we can't debate, but man, let's worship first before we, you know, try to use it to argue with somebody else uh, uh, about over what exactly that means. Um, uh yeah, I was just going to say, uh, I think that was just, I, I, as I read through it again, I think that that part really stuck out to me. And I, and I sort of was worshiping over here. So it's interesting just to keep, kind of hear you. Because I think that, that thought is mind-blowing. Like before the world was formed, like God said, I'm going to have Danny be holy and blameless before me one day. Yes. And I'm, and I'm going to do this whole redemptive plan to include him in that. I, I just think to me that's mind-blowing. And I think for me, if, if I was a church at Ephesus, not only hearing that truth, that, that alone is, is amazing, but yeah. hearing the rest of what's going to come, when those commands come to live my life in light of this, um, it's just going to feel a lot more free to know, mm -hmm. man, like this isn't dependent on me. This isn't on my own strength. And yeah, it's just an amazing, amazing thought to wrap your, man, your, your mind around. And I think this is just one verse, right? And so yeah. I know it's just really sweet to read. Man, amen. That Danny, thank you for that. That is so good. And and doesn't it kind of mirror you guys a, a verse that we all many of us know, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, where he says that we are saved by grace. What does that mean? What does grace mean? It means that there's nothing in us that we did. This is poured out upon us as part of our our election, right? So we are saved by grace through faith. Okay, there's there's the there's the part where the, the sort of the human element in the sense that we feel ourselves doing something, right? I feel myself choosing Christ in faith. So by grace through faith, and it's not according to work so that no one will boast, right? And then, and then he goes on in, in verse 10 to say, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, that we should be holy and blameless for good works, which he prepared in advance that we should walk in them. Okay, so we're, we're seeing God's grace and God's election ultimately result in works that are coming out of us. But what does 2.10 tell us? That he prepared them in advance for us that we should walk in them. 
and that it all results in his glory. And so here we're seeing holy and blameless is a result now of this being chosen before the foundation of the world. And, um, and, and what results now is this holy life that just begins to come out of me. It doesn't mean that it does, it's not work. It just means that it's, it's work that is now has a foundation underneath it of the Holy Spirit being given to us and, and empowering us and fueling us. So I'm just echoing and amening what you said, Danny. And I think you, you said it really, really well that that's, it's that when we get to four through six, man, we, we're realizing all that we have been given. And so why would we not now live out what we already are, which is really what one through three is saying, here's who you are. Verse four, chapters four through six is saying, okay, live according to who you are. So, so good. Any other thoughts or questions on that section? Hey, JD, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, you told us that the whole, the whole, um, section here is one sentence in mm -hmm. Greek and um, obviously this is uh, translated into our English Bibles and my question is with verse 4 how it end like in our English translation it ends with verse 4 ends with in love but right before that there's a period how should we understand that in love like why is it in verse 4 and not in verse 5 I know it's that's not the inspired, you know, part of the Bible. Right. But, and how have you divided it there? And, and what does it mean when, when you do the phrasing like that, that uh, the in love is, is where you put it? Great question. Thanks, Patrick. Um, okay, so let's just remember what is what we understand to be inspired text, okay? Inspired means that, that, that those are the words of God to the best that they have come down to us, right? And let's just talk about some things that are not inspired text added later for help for helpful, helpful reasons, but added later this period. That's the Greek didn't have periods. Okay. Believe it or not. If you ever look at an, at an ancient Greek manuscript, it doesn't have periods. Now here's what's even more crazy. It doesn't have spaces. Okay. So, you are literally looking at just Greek letters with no spaces, no punctuation, nothing in them, just working across the page. So scholars have done an incredible job of, um, you know, of, of really understanding the Greek, bringing the Greek into English, you know, all those things. But here's another thing that's came along later and is not inspired. The verse numbers. I talked about this before in a sermon. The verse numbers actually came about in the, in the 16th century. So we're talking about 1,500 years after the book of Ephesians was written. That's when we're putting chapter and verse in here. Okay, so when somebody came through and put the chapter and verse in verse 5, they decided that in love should go with what came above. Okay, so re let's just read this. That we should be holy and blameless before him in love. Stop. So then they started verse five and they say, okay, that's where the first sentence begins. But the ESV translators, the English translators in, in the translation that I'm looking at, probably the same for you. A lot of modern translations do the same thing. They decided that the sentence should end here and that in love should go with this idea, which came below it. Now, can you guys tell which one I decided when I spent time studying it myself? Can anybody tell just based upon where it's sitting right now, where it should go? Like, like, like what, am, what's the decision I'm claiming? That we should be holy and blameless before him. That we should be holy and blameless before him in love. Yeah. So that, that I'm, I'm arguing there that the period should go after love, not after him. Um, and that's the same as the, whoever decided on the verses, like what we call the versification, the, the, who put the chapter and verse in there, they argued the same thing. And a lot of now modern commentators that are good, solid, conservative scholars, they're, they're, they're kind of pushing the same way. Now, does it really matter in love? He predestined us. Did he predestine us in love? Sure. Sure. Um, should we walk before him holy and blameless in love? 
yes. Um, neither of those things are false. The question is, where does the in love go? Does it go with what came before it or does it go with what comes after it? And that's all you're seeing there is um, you're seeing a question among scholars on where in love goes. So I don't have much more to go on. I'm not going to get super technical into the, the Greek to try to argue for why that is the case, but um, it's just, you got to make a decision if you're studying it one way or another on that. And I can push people to commentaries who want more on that particular issue if you guys want. Um, JD, I actually had a question earlier about just how do we know that it's all one sentence in the Greek if there's no punctuation in the Greek? Uh, yeah. Is it just like a grammatical thing or yeah, so in English it's like, you know, different subjects. <laughs> no, you're, that's a great question. So um, in Greek, every sentence has a main verb. Okay. And believe it or not, the main verb here is blessed be. That's a, that's a main verb that there, there can only be one main verb in a sentence. So blessed be shows up uh, as the main verb. Everything else is relative or subordinate. And I'm using specific grammatical terms here. Relative phrase right here, um, uh, uh, subordinate uh, conjunction. Um, and then what you're seeing here as in him. So for instance, in him, this, this forms a new sentence down here. It's not in him in the Greek, it's in whom. Now, if you change in, if you make it in whom, you've now made it a relative pronoun, which has to go. Um, which has to stay in the same sentence. So sorry for those of you that are not super interested in grammar. I'm a grammar nerd. I love it. Um, and so sometimes I, I overdo it, but I want you to know that this, we do know because of the relative and subordinate phrases, nothing down here is a main phrase, nothing. All of this has been changed to a main phrase by English translators who are trying to chop up the sentence because they know that modern English readers don't like reading long sentences. So that's, it's for that reason. But this is the only main verb in the entire sentence. So good question. Okay, any other thoughts on this, this section here? Um, I, I do wanna work down a little bit more on this section before we move on to the next. Any other questions on that? He chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that whole thing. Okay, so let's, let's just continue to go down. Let's just look at verse five. Um, and again, to, uh, to Nancy's question, the, the Greek here is not he predestined us. The Greek is predestining us. Okay, that's probably a better English uh, wooden translation. Predestining us for adoption of sons. Can you guys see how that has to attach up above and it can't stand on its own? Participles don't stand alone in a sentence. They have to attach to main verbs. And so this thing had to attach up above. So um, he predestined us in the ESV for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. And then we have the first of many to the praise of his glorious grace. Can I just ask about that? What do you think that means? Why did he do these things? He did these things to the praise of his glorious grace. Can anybody shed a little more light on that? What they think that means? We see it here. We see it in verse 12, to the praise of his glory. We see it in verse 14, to the praise of his glory. What do we, what, what do we learn about God from a verse like this? One of the things we learn is that God is in the business of glorifying himself. Can you see that? Uh, it's, it's every major uh, section, I think, except this one. We see this phrase re repeated. Why did God do it? God did it for the praise of his glory. Okay, so this to here, to the praise of his glory, means there's a purpose for it. There's something, there's an end, there's a goal for the thing that he's doing. Um, and what God is doing here is ultimately desiring that this, all that he's doing here, results, terminates, ends in 
the praise of his glory, his glory, his name being lift up, lifted up. We've seen this in the book of Isaiah. For my name's sake, I will do it. God's, God has said that four or five times already in the book of Isaiah. Why am I going to do this? For my name's sake, for the praise of my glory. That's the way Ephesians would say it. To the praise of his glorious grace. So what that, this tells us about God is that he, he seems to be first and foremost in the business of glorifying himself. Um, some of you know the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Um, what is the chief end of man? Does anybody know the answer there on, the, on that catechism? We don't cover it. It's not part of our new city, I don't think. But what is the chief end of man? Anybody know the answer? Is it the, to glorify God and enjoy him forever? Exactly, Nancy. To glorify God and enjoy him forever. What, think about what that question is asking. What is our highest purpose and aim? What is the thing that we are about more than anything else? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. God's, now let me just switch that. What is the chief end of God? What is God's highest thing that God is trying to accomplish, or should I say always will accomplish, because he's God. To give himself the most glory. Yes. Now, here's, what's, here's what I think we can say, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to argue this over months, and it's going to take a long time, but uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a statement that's going to sound a little bit provocative. I believe you can take the Westminster Shorter Catechism, and you can just change it and say, exactly what man is supposed to do. What did we say? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. What is the chief end of God? Exact same answer. To glorify God and enjoy God, right? So to, to, to God's glory, God is about glorifying and enjoying his own presence, his own glory. And this strikes us as weird, right? C.S. Lewis, when he, when he talked about this, said, you know, I used to think that when I, when, I, when I heard that, when somebody taught me that, that it kind of made God sound like an old woman who was fishing for compliments. Like that God is just really interested in me, 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 and I want you all to glorify me, and I care about me. It, it, it sort of has this really selfish ring to it at first. But when we see verses like this, we see that God, every, all of these deep theological things that God is doing, he's terminating them in his own glory. That, and so we need to wrestle with that. Can anybody just give a thought as to why that might not be the case, that God is like an old woman fishing for compliments that he's just sort of a selfish being. Can anybody give a thought as to why that might not be the case when it comes to God? Well, I, I do know that for our own comprehension, we cannot understand like to the extent fullness of God's love or the fullness of God's grace or his glory. So for God to enjoy and to want to receive all the glory from this creation from we can probably see it as somewhat misconstrued as selfish but to god because he is you know because uh, he is god like it, it it should never see that way uh, okay. i don't know what that kind of really support I, yeah, so I'm, I'm hearing you sort of appealing to mystery there. You're, you're appealing to the fact that God is mysterious, his ways are beyond us, and so what seems to us as selfishness must somehow in some way not be selfishness when it, when it comes to God. And, and I think that that's good. That's a good start. I think there are more specifics than that. I think there's some more specifics in scripture that we can understand than just the, the sort of appeal to mystery there. God is above us, he's beyond us, end of story. Anybody else? Can you repeat the question one last time? I'm sorry. Yeah. It, it, it does, does this make God out to be a C.S. Lewis in the way that he was, by the way, I didn't finish the quote by C.S. Lewis. So he has his own answer for this. But he said, I used to think that it makes God sound like an old woman fishing for compliments. In other words, um, he's just sort of selfishly wanting his own aggrandizement. Um, and is that right? 
I think it's a, I think it's a question we have to ask right on the front end of this whole thing, because we're going to see God's glory show up so many times in the book of Ephesians. Is it right for God to say this should end in my glory answers? Um, I think to also kind of go piggyback off of what Andrew was saying. Oh, hang on. Sorry, let me real quick. Take it away, Cisco. Sorry, we have an unhappy child that we're not. Gonna... <laughs> um, so I, I think to kind of go off of, go off of what Andrew's saying, one of the key differences between why it's hard for us to understand God in this is because we are creatures that we don't like. We don't have full control or possession of anything. Yeah. Right. So we kind of spend life grasping after things <laughs> and like part of it is to survive and part of it is like you know when it becomes excessive we call that like selfishness and things like that yeah. so we don't we can't imagine what it's like to be perfectly entitled and in possession of everything and have mm -hmm. everything like already be yours and nor could we handle it is that yeah. kind of what you're yeah yeah so it's just like you know so for us glory is not something we just like naturally possess an abundance it's something we constantly feel like we need to strive and go after mm -hmm. like in our pride right like people want to steal the scene or steal glory from others so it, yeah. I, I just i think in that sense it's it's hard for us to imagine it from god's point of view because he is a perfectly self-sufficient being that already is in power of everything and, and owns everything and controls everything and has everything yeah no i, I think those are those are good those are all good thoughts on that um, is it loving for God? It, let me just ask it a specific question another way. Is it loving to us for God to be about the praise of his own glory? I think it is in the way that God is the greatest good and for his glory to be, be displayed for all the mankind is for all the mankind to, to see God's goodness mm. and so as, as his fame and, and his work is being displayed for people, um, it is, in a sense, not, it is, it is for, for God's glory, but in the same sense, it's also for our own good and for our deepest joy. Mm -hmm. Well said. I, I think that is, that is the way the Bible argues. I think you're exactly right, Patrick. And I, I we read out of that Psalm, oh, it's, I'm drawing a blank, but a a couple of weeks ago in one of the sermons, um, the, that Psalm came up, your nearness is our good. Your nearness is our good. So when you display your glory to us, it is actually meeting our needs in the most full way possible. Because if, if that wasn't true, and if something else would meet our needs better than God, then I would argue that that thing or that person would be God. God. Part of what it means for God to be God is that he is all satisfying. He is to know him, to see him, to be near to him. We're his creation. And so it's like we have this, you know, you've always heard that like youth group, youth campy thing of like, we have a God-sized hole in our heart. Well, that can sound cheesy, but what that's trying to get at is a truth. There is a truth behind that. And that is that we as creation were always created to be near to our creator. And what we're experiencing in the world right now, what we have experienced since Adam and Eve is a separation of us from our creator. And so when God says, I am praising my own glory, what he means is I'm displaying my glory. I'm letting my glory shine forth and all who see that glory and who respond to it and draw near to that glory are, are finding their deepest and highest purpose and their deepest and highest joy in receiving and seeing that. So that what God is saying is I'm acting in love when I display my glory. And, and to me, this has been, mind-blowing to me to understand that his love for me is 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 the same as his displaying his own glory to me 
And so when God does things for his glory, we are getting the benefit of, of, of seeing that display and we are responding to it. And it is, it is our highest good to, to do that. So there's so much more to talk about there. Um, there, are, there are books I can point you to. John Piper has been kind of one of the front runners of this kind of thought. Um, it's called Christian hedonism for those of you that are may have maybe heard that term before. Um, and it's this idea that God's glory and our good are the same thing. So whenever you see verses like this to the praise of his glorious grace, what you do as a Christian hedonist, somebody that understood that believes that in scripture is you go, that's my good right there. That's loving to me when I see to the praise of his glorious grace. So, um, man, I'd love to be able to do, um, you know, several hours on that, but we will, we will move on because we're, we're going to end at 1030. So that gives us 12 more minutes to be able to kind of finish up some things here and wherever we leave off, we can pick up uh, again next week. Uh, but let's move on here to some of the specifics. Notice the connection here at the end of verse six with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Now, who's that? because your English translation capitalized it. That means that we're talking about somebody specific. Um, who is the beloved here? Anybody have a thought? At the risk of, of having a Sunday school answer here. He's talking about Jesus. Yeah, so he's talking about Jesus. How do you know that, Justin? Uh, you just said that this is capital. <laughs> okay, so it's capital, but but that's remember that's an English thing. The Greek didn't have a capital letter there, so the English translator said, "Hey, we want to tip you off as to who this is, so we're going to capitalize it." But how do we know? How do we know he's the beloved? Is it pointing to Song of Solomon? Yeah. Okay. Beloved shows up in Song of Solomon. That's actually tricky. It's that's going to take a long time to try to think through on, um, you know, is he the beloved of Song, of Song of Solomon? Song of Solomon is kind of an allegory of, you know, of a relationship with the Lord. Um, that's a good point. I would say we're going to have to run that down at a later time. How about here in the text? I see is it what followed <laughs> after. Oh, is it what followed after when it calls the bow in him? We have redemption. Yes. Who's the him? pointing to okay a good rule of grammar is if you have a pronoun like him what's the last antecedent what's the last noun that that pronoun could reasonably point to that's probably the one it should point to right so they're following normal grammar grammar rules and they're saying oh we have an in him who's the last him well it's actually the beloved this beloved is the last him here and those things match up. So now, all of a sudden, we find that the beloved, we have redemption through his blood. Well, okay, we, we figured it out, right? We, we know that it's only in Christ who shed his blood so that we might have redemption. So here is, he's blessed us now in Christ. Hasn't he been saying the whole time in Christ, in him, in the beloved, in him, in Christ, in him. By the way, the whole book of Ephesians, 36 times in six chapters, the words in him or in Christ show up. So the Ephesians is full of this idea of being in Christ. And what do we have because we are in Christ? So let's look carefully now at verse seven. In him, we have redemption. What's redemption mean? What's the idea behind redemption? To be brought back. Yeah. And so it applies, it implies that we are what? If we have to be brought back, what does that imply? What's the logic underneath that? They're once condemned. Yes, that we already stand condemned or Good. redempt, re redeemed could be the, the word in the first century was oftentimes used of somebody that you would pull out of debtor's prison. So you guys know debtor's prison was like a place like, like, right, like in our society, we have something called bankruptcy court where you can actually file for bankruptcy and then your creditors don't get to throw you in jail because you 
ran out of money and can't pay them, right? But that wasn't true in the first century. You went to jail if you couldn't pay. And so um, the, the, common, the common idea here behind redemption in the first century was that somebody would come and pay your payment for you so that you could be released out of jail. And so that, the, and I'm not saying that that's, that's all the word means, but that is one connotation of the word, word that was going around at that time was that you to be redeemed is to be released from something for which you are guilty or in debt um, be, through a payment. So a payment is given, you're released, you didn't pay it, somebody else did, right? So that's the idea here. In Christ, we have redemption. What was the payment? Through his blood. Through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses. There's our there's our reason for being in prison, right? There's our reason for our condemnation, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Now, how did, why did all of that happen? It happened according to the riches of his grace. Um, Jesus has within him grace that is rich. I mean, it is beyond rich what Jesus has. And he acted out of that, with that character that was in him in order to redeem us. And then his grace is that which he lavished upon us. He lavished it upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to, the, to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. Okay, so now we're back to God the Father, right? He is God the Father set forth in Christ as a plan. So there's a, there's a little bit of, um, at some point we probably would have to change this phrase a little bit because I'm, I'm realizing that we need, to, we need to understand where God the Father comes back in. Because we've been talking about Jesus, Jesus through his blood, according to the riches of probably right here, probably right here. That his is probably talking about God the Father. Anybody, anybody have a thought there on why it might be God the Father there? According to the riches of his grace. Because the verse before that was this is praise of his glorious grace up the top. Yes. So we're seeing this, um, this to the praise of his glorious grace. There's another verse. There's another verse, chapter two, verse four, right? It just comes to mind where, it says, you know, chapter two, verse one is that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Verse four, but God being rich in so close to grace, mercy, being rich in mercy, he made us alive in Christ and raised us up again. So this whole idea of being rich, rich in grace, rich in mercy, that often is associated with God the Father, okay? Now, is that a scientific answer? No, but it's, it's, a, it's one that as we generally see phrases like this, we generally see them associated with God the Father. So God the Father is rich in grace. He lavished it upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan. So God has had a plan to set Christ forth from the very beginning for the fullness of time. So that is going to cover both ends of the spectrum of the timeline, right? To unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So Christ being set forth was actually a purpose and a plan, not just to redeem us, but to unite all things together in Christ. I think that in him is referring to in Christ. Wow. I mean, we're talking about a scope here that is beyond anything that we normally consider or think about. All things are going to be united, into, united to Christ because Christ was set forth and, his, and salvation was offered through him. Does anybody have a thought on another, other texts or just the idea in general of this idea of all things being brought together in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth, because Christ went to the cross and paid that price. 
Anybody have another verse that talks about this? This is deep theology here. Colossians. Okay, give it to me. Three, five. Let me give you a second. Okay. Yep. Also, uh, Romans 11, 20, uh, 11, 36. Okay, read it. Uh, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Okay, and who's the him there, David? Uh, God, the Father. Okay. From him and to him and through him be all things. Um, there, are, there are definitely other verses that talk about Christ. You know, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm just talking about sometimes we can tell which member of the Trinity we're talking about and sometimes we can't, but um, yeah, it seems to be talking about God the Father there, but there, I, the one that, that Justin's going to bring up is talking about Christ having those things. Um, and, I, and Justin, I think you're referring to Colossians chapter one. Verse 15 to 20. Yeah. Go ahead and read that. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For all things in heaven and on earth were created in him. All things, whether visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions, whether principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. He himself okay. is before all things. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I just want to pause you right there because that's the, that's the thing. Read that last fragment one more time. All the principalities and, and, and those things. Whether principal, okay, it says, uh, all things, whether visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions, whether principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Okay, all things were created through him and for him. All things were created for him. And what does Ephesians here tell us? That he, that this act of Christ being set forth was the, the ultimate goal and purpose is that all things become united in him. What is he talking about here? Things in heaven and things on earth. And Justin, what was it that you read there? Things visible and things invisible. Principalities and powers and all of the stuff in, that we would consider to be in a, in a different realm. Maybe we'd call it the angelic realm, a realm that we don't see physically. All of it is meant to be summed up under Christ. And so this plan was much more than your individual salvation and redemption, although, praise God, it includes that. This plan is to bring all things together back under Christ, we could say, um, because what does Paul tell us has happened to the world, even creation itself, because of sin and because of this separation between God and man? The world is marred and broken. The world is marred and broken. Absolutely. Anybody know where that might be spoken about? I'm thinking like Romans chapter 8, verse 20. I think starting in 20, the creation was subjected to futility by the one who subjected it in hope. Um, and, you know, talking about the creation groaning because of the, and waiting for the redemption of the sons of God. Well, what happens? What happens when the redemption of the sons of God take place? I think this happens. All things become united now under Christ in their rightful place, no longer broken, no longer subjected to futility, but actually finding their fullness where they're supposed to be. At, and when will this happen? This will happen at the fullness of time. So when time reaches its, its full point, when it's, when it's done, um, as far as time as we know it, that's when all these things will take place. So, so I mean, question. Yeah. Um, is it loving to, for God to glorify himself? That just paints a picture of just like, yeah. <laughs> to the sun he doesn't do it to the sun it's the ultimate form it's just it's mind blowing yes yes I mean this is this is why we say uh, Andrew can be right when he says this is kind of for uh, you know it's kind of learning some of the basics of the faith and yet and yet we're for finding depth here that is 
uh, just on another level. Um, so uh, awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna call it because I wanna honor your guys' time. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna pick up in verse chapter one, verse 11, and then we're gonna go all the way through 14 and then next, and then we'll get into 15 through 23 next week. And we're gonna look at this, uh, this section here where Paul is, is praying. So um, I would love to ask somebody to pray for us and then we will, uh, we will be done and we'll see you all next week. Could somebody pray? I can do it. Yeah, pray. All right. Dearly Father, I thank you, God, for being God. I thank you, God, that, that you glorify yourself. Lord, I thank you, God, for your word. I thank you, God, for the people here. I thank you, God, for just that, that we're not able to meet physically, but we're able to do this through the internet. That is crazy right there. And I thank you, God, that, that you love us so much, Lord, that you, that you are so powerful and you are all-knowing and you have all these crazy things, but that, God, you choose us and you've chosen us before the foundations of the earth. So, God, we, we give you praise and we give you honor for you are good and you are great and you are amazing. So, Lord, I pray that you blow our minds even more today. May you show us something crazy about you. Say, show us something that, like, that would be like, whoa, that's all God. So thank you, God. May your name be glorified in this place, at home, wherever we're at, Lord. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe we think about the sun. Maybe we think about the Holy Spirit. Maybe we think about you everywhere we go today, Lord. May you, be, may you be our obsession. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody. It's good to be with you all. And uh, we'll see you next week, if not before. So bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.